Marsha Adams Kitchen is made possible by the Fremont Company, makers of Snowfloss and Frank's Kraut, from our family to your family. Vera Bradley Designs, creators of classic quilted cotton luggage, handbags, tableware, and clothing. And the Altrista Consumer Products Company, marketers of a full line of food preservation products, including ball home canning products. Hello, and welcome to my kitchen. Today, we're going to begin a tour of the Vanderbilt Estate, which is located in Asheville, North Carolina. And we're also going to prepare some foods that would have been served at Biltmore. Biltmore is one of America's castles. Now, the idea of castles in America seems remote. After all, this is a democracy, and we ordinarily connect, in our minds, castles with royalty. But we do have a few such grand houses that even royalty would envy. Let's take a look. Most of us just fantasize about living in a grand house. George Vanderbilt, the grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, was one of the lucky ones. He was able to live out his fantasy. This is the largest private house in America. The driveway is measured in miles, and the floor plan is measured in acres. It took six years to build the Biltmore. Isn't it fantastic? It was a very close collaboration between three men. Richard Morris Hunt, the architect. Frederick Olmsted, the landscape architect. And Vanderbilt himself. The house was completed in 1895, right here in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina. The mansion itself was modeled, actually, after four different French chateaus. With carefully executed architectural details on the house and acres of splendid gardens, Biltmore is privately owned and operated by the family without any government grants or funding. The Commodore, who made the family fortune in railroads and shipping, would have been pleased to see the business management skills of his descendants. The gargoyle carvings are, in reality, water spouts. You see the same approach to rainwater control on Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. There are nearly 700 people on the staff at Biltmore, but I had the feeling I was in a luxurious yet warm and hospitable house. There are 250 rooms, including a bowling alley and swimming pool. The Vanderbilt guests were always entertained, and even the most sophisticated, I suspect, were awed. The house included all of the modern technology of the time, central heating, plumbing, refrigeration, and electricity. It was one of, well, one of the wonders of the world for its Victorian period, 1862 to 1914. Not just idle rich, both George and Cornelia Vanderbilt were also generous philanthropists and furthered black education, as well as building a local hospital, school, and a train station. Indeed, a whole village. The views from the house takes one's breath away. This is the view of Deer Park from the library terrace. It was in March when we visited the estate and the famous azalea and tulip collections were not yet in bloom, but the gardens were still a joy to see. The approach road winds three miles through a delicately controlled landscape along ravines, streams, and ponds. Originally, Vanderbilt bought 125,000 acres of land in this area, and because of his enlightened interest in forest conservation, he sponsored the first school of forestry. This glass-roofed conservatory, designed by Hunt, provides flowering and green plants for Biltmore House, as well as tender bedding plants for the gardens, just as it did in the Vanderbilt days. The central room is filled with palms, banana trees, and orchids. In the summer, this area is filled with 2,000 roses. This is the Italian garden with three ponds containing different types of aquatic plants from all over the world. Forsythia dominates the shrub garden known as the ramble. Taking time for contemplation, I sat in the covered arbor to enjoy it. Everywhere, paths and garden sculpture invite you to discover more delights. Be sure to join us next week when we go inside Biltmore. It is a splendid place and I'm eager to share it with you. If you are ever in that part of the country, be sure to stop in at Biltmore. It's an unforgettable place. We'll be doing two more segments there, so don't miss them. They're very special. The recipes we've planned today are certainly worthy of Biltmore. 
And the king of entrees is always a beef tenderloin. And I personally like this one because it is one of the best cuts of meat to use when entertaining and because it's luxurious and easy to prepare. This recipe is truly an elegant dish because it's filled with a dressing of walnuts and mushrooms. Here are the ingredients. One whole beef filet, approximately three pounds, trimmed and butterflied and at room temperature. Three tablespoons of olive oil, two tablespoons minced onion, one garlic clove, minced, one small red bell pepper, chopped, one half uh, pound fresh mushrooms, finely chopped, one third cup coarsely ground chopped English walnuts, one fourth cup minced parsley, one egg, one fourth cup breadcrumbs, one half teaspoon of dried thyme, or one and a half teaspoons fresh, and one half cup of dry red wine. Have your tenderloin all opened up. Actually, when a tenderloin is butterflied like this, it's sort of like an open book. And place it on eight lengths of butcher's twine. And these pieces are about 15 inches long. Then lay this whole shebang across a shallow roasting pan that has been greased. And the pan we're using here is 12 by 17 inches long. The idea is to have a shallow pan so the heat from the oven circulates freely around the roast, which gives it that roasted flavor. Now we're going to make the stuffing. Heat your oil in a saute pan and cook the onions and the garlic and the red peppers for about five minutes. Then add the mushrooms, cook them seven minutes longer, but make sure that all the liquid has evaporated out. Mushrooms have a lot of water in them and will make your dressing soggy and too wet. So when this begins to sizzle, you'll know that the water is out. Now we want to stir in the walnuts and the parsley. Isn't this going to be delicious? You can tell that already. Then we're going to beat the egg, and to this add the breadcrumbs, beat those in, and the thyme. And here we are with this mixture. There's just enough breadcrumbs and just enough thyme, excuse me, breadcrumbs and egg combination here to hold this all together. Now add this to the cooled mixture of mushrooms and put this together. You could make this stuffing um, a day or so in advance and refrigerate it until needed. That really helps. Uh, that's the Swiss cheese method of time management that I'm always harping about. You know, my father was a time management uh, freak, and so I have grown up with that attitude. Now, what we're going to do here is put an inch of stuffing down just one side of the filet, or one side, if you like, of the book and it should be just about an inch thick. Now some of this cr crumbles out onto the pan, that's all right, don't worry. You may have sometimes just a little bit too much dressing. This depends on the size of the filet and the generosity of your butcher, and perhaps the size of the Angus beef, if that's what it is, and around here it probably is. We have lovely filets here in the Midwest because we have such a good beef crop. Wherever you find corn and alfalfa, you will find good beef. There we are. I think that's about right. Now, we're going to close up the book like this. Some book, right? And the dressing is the message. There. So get this here, okay? You want to cook it seam side down, so this is a good time to do it. Now, when I was a girl on the farm growing up, we had our own beef, of course, and butchered it. But the filet was always reserved for company. And my mother, who was ahead of her time as a cook, and a lot of other ways too, um, would fill it with something good like this. And each time it was different because she never used recipes. And I, of course, was too young. My brothers and I were too young to be invited to these dinner parties. So we had to watch from afar and not even let people know that we were watching. And I used to envy those people thinking, oh, it'd be so much fun to be growing up and watch and the conversation and the pretty clothes, but most of all, eat the beef tenderloin. I am so glad that I am now old enough to eat tenderloin at the table. Now, how many more minutes do I have left here? Because I have still a couple of little things to do. All right, I may not finish all this time. Tying, because after all, tying is tying, and you certainly can figure out the rest of that on your own. Well, I'm not sure if I can't, if you can. There we are. Then, tidy this up a bit. There's no point in having roasted string. You're going to uh, cut this off anyway, later. 
like this. This is truly a wonderful uh, sort of dish. And what I like about it is, um, this is maybe one piece of meat, but nonetheless, well, I think I'll skip that. Nonetheless, this is going, this could easily serve 20 people. You should have a lot of uh, vegetables, however, and some potatoes and pastas and all those things. Now, to finish this up, we're going to use the remaining two tablespoons of oil and add about a half a cup of red wine to that. I think that's enough. You'll notice I'm using Meyer's wine. That's a superb Ohio wine. And we did a trip to their uh, winery one time. You may remember it on another series. And I have drunk Meyer's wine ever since, including their sherry, which is served at the White House. Now, brush this mixture all over the filet like this. And um, I mean, be lavish. I mean, splash it on. Don't be serious about cookery. You know, recipes are not engraved in stone. It's not holy writ. It did not come down from the mount. So change recipes if you want to and have fun with your cooking. Now, this is what we do next. You want to bake this at 425 degrees for 10 minutes. Reduce the heat to 350 and cook an additional 30 to 35 minutes for medium rare. That's about 150 to 160 degrees on your meat thermometer.